things happened way beyond probably what anyone intended to. Probably things like the 1934 uh, elections where all these people are killed. That probably wasn't something that that was more uh, people were sent out to make sure to keep things in line. And they kept things a little too in line, which is why, uh, you know, Pendergast's uh, main mob ally gets, of course, murdered himself. You don't need to be elected to control a city. Kansas City's Tom Pendergast ran the city from 1925 to 1939. He wielded his power from a second-story office, awarding jobs and city contracts to himself and friends. His support of a young haberdasher led to Harry S. Truman becoming a U.S. Senator and eventually President of the United States. Their bond was so tight that Truman took the unprecedented move as a newly minted vice president to attend the mobster's funeral. This is Scams and Cons. I'm Jim Grinstead, and I'm going to tell you just how he did it. Pendergast's power didn't require a Machiavellian plot. It was as simple as giving the people what they wanted and making sure his political soldiers delivered on those promises. And when a person refused to give him what he wanted, namely their vote, Pendergast made sure they paid the price. Pendergast came from St. Joseph, Missouri, a fair-sized town that lies between Kansas City and Omaha. Jesse James died there. Rapper Eminem was born there. It was also the starting point of the Pony Express. If you want to blame someone for Tom Pendergast's rise to power, you need to look no further than his elder brother Jim. Jim had moved to Kansas City to work in the city's foundries. In later years, the future boss, Tom, moved to Kansas City to join his brother. Jim ended up owning a saloon called Climax. Rumors had it that he bought it with the winnings from a bet he made on a horse named Climax. Jim bought the American House Saloon in 1881, and later when Tom got to town... They co-owned the Pendergast Brothers Saloon in the city's industrial West Bottoms, a place where organized crime thrived. It was the perfect place for all kinds of people to whip up a little graft, and Tom was in the catbird seat to watch it all. Farmers moved their animals by train to the nearby auction house where they could be sold, so its customers included stockyard workers. Prohibition ran from 1920 to 1932, but... Kansas City was known as a wide-open town where trivial things such as laws didn't matter much. The saloon also provided a convenient location for other players such as liquor peddlers, prostitutes, and bookies to ply their trades. Loan sharks preyed on the factory workers who were in need of cash. Scams and cons were everywhere, and Tom learned from both the grifters and the suckers how the games were played. In those days, power was in the hands of the Democrat Party, which maintained power through ward healers. Ward healers made sure that those who got favors from the party stayed loyal to it. They pressured those who were not loyal to see the light or else be victims of violence or other punishments. The party also took care of those in need. Poor families or those who fell on hard times got food and shelter. As saloon owners, Jim and Tom were in a good position to provide those services and gain party support. In 1887, Jim became a party committeeman, which meant he enlisted the people the party wanted in power. The party told him what it wanted, and Jim got it done. In 1892, Jim was on the city council ballot for the first ward, and as expected, won the seat. During his short time on the council, he was able to steer police away from saloons, especially his own and see that his constituents got out of jail for any minor crimes they may have committed. But politics wasn't that simple for Jim. Here's part of a presentation for the Kansas City Library by Ingrid Weaver. The brothers and their followers, called the Goats, had planned to control the Kansas City area in Jackson County, but Joe Shannon, another city alderman, and Baron Bill Nelson, publisher of the Kansas City Star, sought to oppose them with a group of followers called the Rabbits. 
This was the beginning of the political feud between the goat and rabbit factions. Though both groups were Democrats, they had very different political views. Nelson and Shannon did not agree with the Pendergasts when it came to most vice industries. By 1900, the goat and rabbit factions had become more tense. Jim feared that the rabbits would take back political power, so he initiated a 50-50 compromise. Tom continued to work closely with his brother. He could use his large size and reputation as a fighter to intimidate potential enemies, while his smile and wit could win supporters. As Jim's health began to fail, Tom stepped in to fill the void. Jim would die in 1911. By 1925, the Pendergast machine had full control of, over the city. They had five out of nine city council members who were handpicked by Tom Pendergast. Through the city council, they appointed Henry McElroy, city manager. And the city manager position was really more powerful than any other position in Kansas City at the time. And so Henry McElroy is manager in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the city. Reformers had hoped that the manager would be this professional who kind of takes care of business in proper ways. But since he was Pendergast's man, it was very improper. Whenever they uh, did city construction projects, uh, McElroy would make sure that these contracts went to companies that were owned by Tom Pendergast. Pendergast, he owned mostly construction companies, basically everything from quarries to cement. There was a ready mix cement company, it was one of his big ones. He had insurance companies, he had liquor companies, which at least officially they changed to you know, beverage companies during Prohibition at the time. So all of these city contracts went through McElroy to, back to Pendergast and he gets the money. And it's, so there's this circle of money. Pendergast is always getting his cut, and people affiliated with the machine would get their cut, and in exchange, he gets lots of votes. On election days, they could pay people to vote. They, they could hire um, what they called ward healers to go precinct by precinct and intimidate voters from the opposition or bring out their own voters. The election of 1934, for example, there were four people killed at the polling sites by Pendergast ward healers. That was Jason Rowe of the Kansas City Public Library, which has an extensive exhibit about the Pendergast regime. Tom had one major weakness, the horses. He spent time working liquor and concession stands at the Kansas City Driving Club, a local track. He placed bets and he lost big. At some point, he racked up several hundred thousand dollars, and that's 1930s Great Depression era dollars, several hundred thousand dollars of gambling debts. He needed to raise even more money than his corrupt machine could raise to pay off these gambling debts. Eventually, in the late 30s, 1937 and 8, he got involved in an insurance kickback scheme. And actually, the scheme, it's not clear whether he broke the law with the scheme itself. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't explain that. But where he really ran into trouble is that he didn't report the income to the IRS for income tax on his, on his tax returns. So... Just like Al Capone, it was the IRS that finally caught up with Tom Pendergast and went to jail in Leavenworth, the federal penitentiary. Pendergast was nothing by this point, by 1945, and Pendergast died 
natural causes. While Jim was fully engaged in party politics, Tom began to successfully run the party's cons and develop the reputation as a hard worker. That got him the title of First Ward Deputy Constable and Deputy Marshal in 1896. By 1900, he was Superintendent of Streets, and his reputation grew because of his management skills. During that time, he provided jobs for 250 political allies. Pendergast realized constituents would tolerate corruption as long as their needs were met. It was a strategy that later served Chicago's Richard J. Daley. Tom's power allowed him to start and hold a stake in many businesses, businesses that always seemed to win city contracts. At the peak of the organization's power, his sanitary service company contracted with the municipal government to collect the city's trash. As vice president of Ready Mixed Concrete, he supplied concrete to the city's $50 million 10-year plan improvement program that voters approved in 1931. Those projects included the county's courthouse, a new arena, city hall, police headquarters, and numerous public works projects such as Brush Creek, a stormwater management system. Under the 1935 Ready Mix contract, the company laid concrete 8 to 10 inches thick and 70 feet wide across the bottom of Brush Creek. The project was a 10.5 mile stream that spanned three counties and to this day runs through Kansas City's famous Country Club Plaza. It cost the city $1.5 million at the time, about $30 million in today's dollars, and reportedly endangered more than 40 fish species. Which brings us to Harry Truman. Truman had started a haberdashery with a former army buddy. The store struggled, but one day Jim Pendergast and his father, known as MJ, entered Truman's life. Here's John Heron at the Kansas City Public Library. A visit that summer from Jim Pendergast and his father, Mike, also known as MJ, to Truman's failing business, inquiring about his interest in a job of politics would lead to the next chapter in his life. Once again, in Truman's words, Jim Pendergast brought his father, MJ, to see me at the little store Eddie Jacobson and I were operating. MJ asked me if I would consider the nomination to the county court from the Eastern District. In classic Truman understatement, he replied, I would. So in the war, Truman garnered a significant political base, including the men with whom he served who proved incredibly loyal for decades. So he gains all these strong supporters who were his combat in arms in World War I, but also he gains the connection to the Pentagast machine. That machine, those that family supported him throughout his rise through political ranks. Jason Rowe of the Kansas City Public Library picks it up. The governor of Missouri, Guy Park, Park himself was a Pendergast crony. The power actually went statewide. By 1932, when he got Guy Park elected, and they had influence for, for the state of Missouri, representation at the Democratic National Convention. In the 1930s, Pendergast eventually selected Truman to be senator for Missouri. He was elected in a statewide vote, but, but at this point, I believe the number was that he could produce about 70,000 fraudulent or ghost votes um, in any given election. And so with that, just the sheer number of votes that he could produce out of Kansas City that would be tallied and they were official whether they were real or not. He had that, the power to, to do this and, and he had plenty of, of real support. He would, Pendergast machine affiliates could win elections um, even without stuffing ballot boxes because they gave people jobs. They, they built infrastructure throughout the city. They had roads. If you look, walk around the city today, you can see 
There's uh, the courthouse still there. Municipal auditorium, 10,000 seats, it's still there. By 1932, he was on top of the world. I mean, he was sending delegates to the Democratic National Convention. He had senators, governor of Missouri, big portion of the state legislature. Tom died of natural causes in 1945. So Truman, who just became vice president, came to the funeral of Tom Pendergast during wartime on a military plane. It's a big controversy. <laughs> Weeks later, Roosevelt died, and Truman was president of the United States. While Truman didn't abandon his friend, he was never comfortable in his position between a criminal and his efforts to be an honest politician. During his tenure as presiding judge, Truman wrote, according to Heron, The boss wanted, to, wanted me to give a lot of crooked contractors the inside, and I couldn't. Later, Truman stated, Boss Tom never asked him to do anything dishonest, and quote, that's the God's honest truth, he concluded. I did my job the way I thought it should be done, and he never interfered. Well, let's be clear. That, that may be true or true enough, but that's not the same thing as saying Truman did not have to support unethical deals or no-show work contracts or financial corruption because he did. We know how he felt about that because Truman wrote about it a lot. And he was more than a little angry, but he also knew that this is how business was conducted in Kansas City. At one point, Truman wrote in a private diary, I wonder if I did right to put a lot of no account sons of bitches on the payroll and pay other sons of bitches more money for supplies than they were worth. Well, the operative phrase being there, sons of bitches, like we know what he's thinking. He used all kinds of gymnastics to justify such decisions. At one time, once again, asking himself in these private diaries, am I a fool or an ethical giant? Am I just a crook to compromise in order to get the job done? Well, looking for an answer from no one in particular, he concluded, you judge, I can't. It's time to hear from a Pendergast himself. This audio is part of a talk captured by KCTV5 in Kansas City, formerly known as KCMO. It features James Pendergast, nephew of Tom Pendergast, and was recorded in July of 1956. He talks about Pendergastism and his support of local candidates for public office. He claims that whatever you think about Tom Pendergast's record and methods, the old ways of doing things, are long past. Much has been written about my uncle, Tom Pendergast, in Kansas City's early days, enough to fill a hundred volumes. Some very good things have been said about him, and some very bad things. People with judgment, historians, political experts, the worker, the newsboy on the corner, the clerk, and the housewife, at one time or another, all have voiced their sincere judgment on the merits of the system under Tom Pendergast. The years have been filled with a thousand verdicts on his contribution to this community, on the good or evil that took root under his party. The record shows quite plainly that it all came to a tragic end for Tom Pendergast in 1939. It was a collapse brought on by forces so complex and so far-reaching as to defy a simple explanation, and certainly to make a fool of anyone who attempts it. I am not the one to say on this occasion whether Tom Pendergast was part saint or part sinner, part benefactor or part boss, good Samaritan or mischief maker. I am not the one to say he was too merciful, or too greedy, or whether he was all of these things, or part of them, or none of them. It is not for me to judge. That is the task of some greater power. But I have a personal opinion, which I seek to impose on no one. 
I know that I share it with many thousands of others. We have certain memories about him. We remember him for his kindness and charity, his many gifts of food, clothing, coal, and money to the needy poor. I feel with thousands of others that our town made substantial gains under Tom Pendergast. The county courthouse, city hall, the municipal court building, the municipal auditorium, all of these were built without a breath of scandal. And under Mr. Truman's careful supervision as eastern judge of the county court, the Jackson County road system was rated second only to the leading county in America, Westchester, New York. Tom Pendergast was shorn of power almost 20 years ago. He died 11 years ago. A generation has been born in the meanwhile. Great changes have occurred, sparked by new ideas and new concepts. But the obsolete tactics of some politicians remain unchanged. They are puzzling to voters in this as in past elections. I submit that the label of Pendergast has no meaning. It belongs to an era now gone. If you enjoy the podcast and want to support it, please consider doing so via Patreon. For just $10 a month, you'll help us keep the lights on so we can continue to create great content for you. You can sign up at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Then search for Scams and Cons. There'll be a link in the show notes. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for listening.